next speaker is Chris Hamilton. Now, I've known Chris since 2007, and I can truly and honestly say that Chris is one of the great minds in payments today. <clears throat> Destroyed it. Yeah, it's hopeless. <laughs> so the expectation is very high. Yeah, Chris. thanks for that. <laughs> uh, as you know, and or might know, Chris is the new CEO of Banks of Africa. Um, he moved from the Australian Payments Clearing Association as CEO. Uh, before that, he spent 11 years in senior roles at the Australian Stock Exchange. He also started working life as a commercial lawyer. Now you understand why I'm saying he's one of the great minds in payments. <laughs> at his time at APCA, he helped the EFTPOS company, Australia's domestic debit card scheme, and oversaw the creation of the new payments platform program, which is scheduled to deliver new real-time data-rich, ubiquitous payments infrastructure for Australian payments in late 2017, using network technology supplied by SWIFT. He also worked to create and served on the Australian Payments Council, a joint public-private initiative to provide strategic direction in, Australia, in Australian payments. Now, <clears throat> you can see the focus is on technology. However, there are certain other forces playing out. Chris will share with us the forces that are playing out. And Chris, uh, I'm going to ask to share some international insights into these forces and how they play out. Over to you. Let's welcome Chris. Thanks very much. Um, and I will, I will do my best with that outrageously um, complimentary introduction. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you. Um, did we have a good lunch? Yes. Lots of nice chat. Anyone going to fall asleep in the after lunch session? I've got to say, that's kind of a weakness of mine, so I don't feel too bad. And if I nod off, perhaps you could just throw something or, or something like that. Um, no, actually, usually getting up and speaking in front of a group of people makes sure you've got enough adrenaline going through your system that you don't fall asleep. But I understand if it happens to you, you know, so that's okay. I'll try and keep it interesting. Um, I want to talk to you, to, having said that, I want to talk to you today about payments infrastructure design which is a little bit like talking to people about sewerage and plumbing, in the sense that we all need it, it's all got to work, but we don't really want to spend a lot of time talking about it. And I've got to say, if there's one thing that encapsulates the point I want to make to you today, it is that we kind of do need to find a way as an industry to talk about this and talk about it very systematically. Uh, because payment system design does not happen by itself, even though people often think it does. And it's a, a very, very hard collaborative grind. And I want to use some international examples to explain that and talk through that a little bit. Um, I'll try and leave some time at the end for questions. But if you've really got a burning issue, or you think I'm wrong, remember I'm a complete newbie on South Africa, so I'll try and avoid saying anything about South Africa. But if you think I'm wrong or you've, you've got a strong query, stick your hand up and we'll talk about it. It's always better if it's a little bit interactive and I think we can get away with it in, in this audience. We'll see how we go. Um, I, I put a sort of sexy title on the, on the talk to get people in, so that more or less worked. Thanks for that. Um, it, it, the herding cats part of it is because the, the necessity is that your payment system serves many, many different business agendas and it cannot avoid doing that. Not just business agendas too, there are, there's government public policy agendas, um, there is the non-profit sector, um, and somehow you've got to crunch all of those different agendas and different needs down into something that's going to serve us all in some way. And you only get to do this once every 20 to 30 years if you look around the world. When someone puts a payment system in, that's how long it lasts for. Now, I know people are telling you that the... the life cycle and the internet is shortening and everything's going much faster. And that may be true. But the reason why this stuff takes 20 or 30 years is not about technology and therefore probably won't be affected by that. It's about people. It's about the fact that all of those different business agendas come from different business organisations that have to somehow find a meeting of minds. And that's why this stuff is incredibly hard. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time today 
talking about how the world's going to be really different in the future. There are plenty of talks in the next two days and at every other conference that you're going to go to that will tell you about the Internet of Things and the cloud and the new digital economy and digital disruption and all of those things. I'm not interested in scaring you, which is kind of what consultants do in order to get consulting gigs. Um, rather, I want to direct attention to the fact that if even a fraction of that is true, the implication is not how can we use that new tech in the payment system, although that's important and someone and people are looking at that. The critical impl implication is, is our payment system in its current basic configuration, is it ready for that economy? Is it going to serve that economy well? Because if it's not, then we've all got a collective problem. So, you know, boiling down the payments infrastructure of most countries, you come down to roughly, usually, three main sets of rails. And you can argue in South Africa whether there are more than that, put, put that to one side. But there's usually some kind of ACH or EFT or call it what you will. In Australia, they call it direct entry just to be different, but, you know, electronic payments. There's usually some cards rails and there's usually some high value rails. And ever since uh, time immemorial, and of course, um, I, I, I should mention, of course, the paper environment as well, um, we have been expecting our customers to adapt the way they do business to our sets of rails. So if you want to do, you want to buy something in a shop, at some point you've got to get out your card. And we can do all sorts of clever technological things with that action, but we're still fundamentally expecting the customer to do something that suits our payments environment. Um, if you want to buy something online, you've got to go to somewhere else where there's a payment gateway, a bank, uh, possibly a card gateway, whatever. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the way the whole world works right now. But in that future economy, is that the way things are going to work? So in an environment where and I saw a fantastic, you know, one of those great little vignettes a little while ago. I'm driving down the road in my late model, I don't know what it was, BMW, Mercedes. Actually, no, it's driving down the road. I'm doing the crossword, right? And um, it decides that it needs a Grecian oil change and one of its tyres is low on pressure. So it emails ahead to the nearest town to find out if, an, uh, you know, to make an appointment with a mechanic so that it can book itself in for a service so that I don't get interrupted too long on my journey. You know, those kind of stories that you hear. That's the Internet of Things stuff, the fact that all of our devices will be doing things for us. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I'm not sure our payment rails are quite ready for that stuff. And so to the extent that that's actually where we're going, we need to think about the rails, mainly because rails take a really long time. Uh, any conversation you're having now about the possibility of a new payment infrastructure of some kind will take, on you know, global sort of norms, five years to come to fruition. And that's doing it pretty well. So what is South Africa's payment system in five years' time? What does that look like? Anyone want to stick their hand up and answer that one for me? Because that would save us all a lot of time, I think. <laughs> pity, pity. <laughs> Okay, so enough about the digital economy. Just keep in mind, we're not building for now. We're building for a distant future that we only dimly see, but we have to do something about it because there's a five-year lead time in doing infrastructure. Okay, payment systems are fundamentally networks, and I'm using that in a non-technological sense. When people say networks, they think technology. I'm not a technologist. I've managed to keep my brain largely a technology-free zone in 20-something years of working in payments. Um, but uh, networks are an economic phenomenon. They require the coordinated action of multiple nodes. That's basically the definition of a network. So any payment system requires the coordinated action of the participants in the payment system. Duh, I hear you say. But people forget this. These guys forgot this, right? Bitcoin is a beautifully designed piece of technology that is socially unworkable. That's my assertion, okay? 
socially unworkable because it assumes that, not only assumes, actually wants you not to have any central authority, no form of governance, no central bank, no committee overseeing the system. It's a technology that's specifically designed to get rid of the need for any of those central things. And it succeeds. Technologically, it succeeds. And for a while there, it looked like the answer to all our problems. But now, who, who actually uses Bitcoin in here? Does anybody muck around on the thing? Cool, Marianne, of course you do. Of course you do. Um, what's the turnaround time like now, Marianne? How long does it take? Yeah. Okay. So that's not real time. Actually, that's better than I thought you were going to say, but, but it's not real time. And uh, according to the literature, it's getting slower. The, the Bitcoin blockchain is filling up and there is a complexity around retooling that. And this is where the social bit comes in. If you want to design something that's never going to change and it's on a take it or leave it basis, then you don't have to get anyone to agree. You can just do it and put it out there. If it gets taken up, it gets taken up. And if it doesn't get taken up, that's just bad luck, right? But as soon as you've got a large number of people relying on this technology, this standard, and feverishly beavering away mining and transacting and speculating and all the things that they're doing, and something goes wrong with your technology, it's not big enough. You need a larger block size, uh, to take the Bitcoin example. Or it doesn't matter what it is. A vulnerability is identified. Then you have to get all those people to change. That's what it, they, this is the hard fork problem that they talk about in Bitcoin. There are soft forks. You can adapt the Bitcoin so that it's backwards compatible meaning that the, the guys on the new standard can still talk to the guys on the old standard, simplistically. But on something like a blockchain size change, it's a hard fork. You're going to create, in effect, an old Bitcoin and a new Bitcoin and neither twain shall meet, probably. But to do that, you've got to get some part of the community to agree that that's what we're doing and that's the right answer, and that is what the Bitcoin community has manifestly failed to do, at least so far. So there are several competing solutions to the hard fork in Bitcoin and none of them seem to be working right now. So, um, and that's a purely human problem. The technology is brilliant, but there's no oversight. There's no governance. There's no way for the community to agree. Mike Hearn, one of the early American pioneers of the Bitcoin uh, movement, who was a huge enthusiast, um, came up with one of the proposed solutions, uh, XT, I think it's. Bitcoin XT, have I got that right? Some experts may know. Um, and he actually like toured the Chinese miners, you know, the, like the mining is being done in coal parts of the world with super uh, tuned computers running very, very fast to maximise return. And sort of, you know, more than a third of the, the Bitcoin mined and processed is being done in China with three suppliers, right? He went to them and said, can we agree to change? And from their business perspective, why should they? They're making lots of money the way it's working at the moment. There's no incentive. So they just went, nah. That's the problem we have with payment systems. How are we going to align the business agendas? OK, so let's talk about some of the solutions to that problem and using some international analogies. I don't expect you to be able to read those things. You can look at them online. They're all published. Important point here, to do this right, you've got to publish stuff. You've got to put your views out there and allow people to argue, debate, contradict, change, etc. That's a selection of the work that the Payments UK organisation has been doing over the last uh, two years odd on the next generation of UK payments, which they call world-class payments. Slightly confused by the fact that they actually have no power anymore, and the Payment Strategy Forum, which is a government-sponsored body, has just published its own views, which luckily take a lot of account of what these guys have been doing, so it's not all bad news. But my point is, there's an enormous amount of empirical work going on here. Be inquisitive. You, you actually, to work out what your payment system needs to look like, you have to understand how people are likely to use it in 10 years' time. Seems obvious, huh? Who knows how they're going to use it in 10 years' time? I certainly don't. You have to go through that process. You have to do the analysis. Ask businesses ask consumers, look at their forward thinking and come to some kind of publishable, defensible view on that. Will you be right? Probably not. In fact, it's almost certain that on a 10-year horizon you'll be wrong in material 
degrees. The point, though, is your community has gone through that work and has come to some sort of a consensus. And unless you do that, how do you know you're even close to right? So, uh, so the UK is an example of that. Now, whether they'll ever build this world-class payments thing is a, is a genuine question. There are a lot of politics to go through before they get there. But at least they're doing the thinking work up front. Um, be inclusive. Always easy to say and always very hard to do. The US is probably the world's hardest payment market and the least designed one because it's just too big. There are 13,000 payment institutions. Um, there are, you know, uh, millions of interested parties. Um, the, one of the legacies of the slightly unusual banking regulation, the state-based banking regulation in the US, is that you've got a plethora of small financial institutions which are, to some degree, and I wouldn't say this to an American audience, propped up by regulation. So, you know, you've got a, you've got a, a very complicated environment, and so if you're going to be inclusive, that's kind of a hard, a hard sell. Lots of hard work involved. Um, the Fed, which has no statutory mandate for payments at all, has taken this job on, God bless them. Uh, it ain't easy. They, uh, they have, in the last two years or so, published their own consultation paper, again, publication, received thousands of responses, put together a task force, which is only 300 people, <laughs> to talk about this issue. I can't imagine chairing a task force of 300 people, <laughs> but someone's doing it. Um, and have had a serious go, and you can't see the, the groups there, but we're not just talking the usual suspects. These are consumer representatives, business representatives, um, service providers, consultants, banks, of course, um, central infrastructures, and so on. Um, there's an executive committee of a smaller group that might have some kind of a hope of making a decision, which would be good. But, uh, you know, so they've got this massive um, industry-wide discussion going on in a very public way. And everybody's business agenda gets an airing and gets at least a chance to convince other people that they've got the best interests of the system at heart. And I think that's kind of a good thing, although by crikey it must be painful, I imagine. Um, now, what happens in the, in the US is still very unclear, actually, because there's no formal endpoint to this process. The next thing they're going to do, or they have been doing actually, I think they had the first of these already, is a sort of a showcase of candidate solutions. So they've used this process to come up with some principles for what a good payment system might look like. And they've said, okay, come at us, you know, to give us some proposals. And so people have been demonstrating proposed solutions to this community. And the difficult thing is what then happens, because there's no decision process here. So no one gets to decide, yeah, it's that one. Uh, you know, I, I think they're hoping osmotically the best, the best one floats to the surface. The most likely success story is the Clearinghouse, which is another central infrastructure in, in the US, which has teamed with Vocalink, a UK payments company, uh, now possibly going to be an American payments company, but anyway, that's another story, um, uh, to propose their own version of a payment solution. Now, they only have to convince their shareholders, who are a small subset of those 13,000 institutions, they're the big guys, basically. Um, but that's, so that seems to have the best likelihood of achieving a critical mass in that community. So I think the US is on its way to a concept that is implementable, but they've got the hardest environment in the world to do it. Just quietly, in this country, with less than 50 payment institutions, we, it should be a lot easier for us. I, I, I say that advisedly, but, but uh, it's better than 13,000. Okay, so this slide's not to subtly suggest that the Canadians are a couple of horses' asses. Um, what, what I'm trying to get to here is that um, what the microeconomists call path dependence is one of the besetting sins of payment system design. Path dependence simplistically means um, if, I, if it worked that way in the past, we should just tweak that rather than try and start from first principles again. Simplistically, that's path dependence. The horse reference, and you probably all heard, heard this bit of doggerel from the internet. It's, it's, so there's a lot of stuff on the internet if you go and look. But the argument is... Sorry, let me go back a step. 
55% of the world's railways have the same rail gauge, four foot eight and a half inches. Why four foot eight and a half inches? The answer is because when two horses stand side by side, that gives you roughly that wheel rut for a cart following behind them. Uh, and the very first railways were built by Stevenson and his mates for um, coal, actually, to horse-drawn drays dragging coal up and down the uh, mines in Wales. And then that went from there to the very first passenger railway and so forth and so on. And the argument is they just kept reusing the tools and the equipment that they had developed for that solution. That's path dependence. So now we have high-speed trains going at 360 kilometres an hour on the same rail gauge. Is that the best rail gauge for a 360 kilometre hour train? I don't know, but it's the one we have because of path dependence. Um, payment system got the same problem. If you think about it, nearly all of basic sets of rails we use today owe their beginning to the Bill of Exchange, which was first invented by a bunch of um, Florentine merchants in about 1250, I think along with double entry bookkeeping. So the check system that we have today is only an even evolution from bills of exchange which were needed to conduct trade across borders in Europe in the Middle Ages. And uh, our electronic systems when they came along were adapted from those models so you can still see the tracks of those, the traces of those sorts of systems in what we do today. I'm not sure that's the best place to start for that digital economy, internet of things, cloud that we were just talking about at the beginning. You guys can form your own views. But I do think we ought to come at it from first principles and at least think about whether that's the best place to be. Um, that little diagram on the right-hand side is a thing by Payments Canada, um, the, the Canadian payments organisation. A little bit different from PASA because they actually run the high-value system. They, they run big bits of kit, uh, and, uh, and so they've got a statutory status and a, you know, a, a bigger role, I guess, overall. And they have spent the last three years working on modernisation of their payments infrastructure, and they have not cut a line of code yet. They are thinking very, very deeply and very thoughtfully about it. And good luck to them, actually. You don't want to rush this stuff. That, that diagram is one way, and they've published this again, one way of thinking about the efficiency frontier in payment systems. So um, efficiency in the, on the x-axis, safety on the y-axis, their argument is there's a trade-off between those two things. You can't have a completely safe and completely efficient payment system. You have to make some trade-offs. And intuitively that's actually true. Whether it's universally true is probably debatable. But, but we all know the experience that to make a card system, for example, or a commonly used retail system, more secure often involves less convenience to the consumer. So that's the sort of argument they're running, right? And those dot points are sort of acceptable trade-offs based on certain criteria on that frontier. How far off am I? I'm okay? Cool. Um, so uh, you, could, you can argue, you can debate all this stuff, every individual assumption you could argue with, but that kind of, that's kind of the point. Let's, let's actually do that work and have those arguments. Uh, and it's all published. OK, Australia's MPP. I, I, I only wanted to use examples where I've actually spent some time in country and have a shot at vaguely understanding what the hell they're going on about. This one, obviously, I've spent more time on than the others. Um, the NPP felt like an overnight success because what happened in quick succession in 2000 and was um, Central Bank comes out with a strategic review that says, you guys have to build a real-time payment system. We're going to give you six months. And if you haven't got a good proposal by then, you're going to build this one, an extra, C and extra A, right? Pretty aggressive stuff. Scared the hell out of the banks, I tell you. So uh, we did. We actually put together a committee of bankers and very, very quickly came up with, again, a published proposal for a... Um, real-time payment system, which became the new payments platform. I'm not going to spend any time today on the design of it or why it's like it is. Um, so that felt like an overnight sensation. How could we have done all that thoughtful empirical work? How could we have done all that analysis to come up with that answer? Well, actually, we've done it all before. 
We're just waiting for the catalyst, right? So 2008, um, the Australian Payments Clearing Association published a thing called the Low Value Payments Roadmap, which pretty much sank without trace at the time. Uh, almost no attention paid at all. But it said, you know what, we should adopt ISO 20022. It said payment systems should be real-time settled as well as cleared, which is pretty radical at that time. Um, it said uh, we should uh, have a universal bus, I've, I've forgotten the exact term, but I think it said something like that, um, that connects every source and destination of payments, and we should allow variations on that theme. And that latter idea became what, what are now called overlay services. So the basic ideas in that thing that we managed to cobble together in 2013 were initially floated in 2008 to no sort of critical acclaim at all. There was very little interest. But what we did do was put together a group of techos from the banks who at that time were starting to play with ISO 2022 themselves for client-side purposes and get them to talk about how they would retool the system for ISO 2022. And I know that kind of work's been going on here, so that's actually really important. Um, you know, the familiarisation with the tools and the concepts is a very important step in the evolution, which has to then wait for the social stuff, the governance, getting the guys, the business guys with the decision-making powers together to make the right decisions. Um, you'll be able to study... Um, apologies for the size of the print. You'll be able to study it when you get the slides. The only other point I wanted to make here was that we benefited enormously in Australia from a spectacular failure. Um, there was a thing called Mambo um, in 2009, again in 2010, and again in 2011. Um, they weren't going to give up easy. Uh, Mambo was a proposal that the big banks, the big four, spent some hundreds of billions of dollars on, uh, working on, conceptualising, which ultimately they did not proceed with, and I won't go into the details of why. But that fairly public failure, it was a source of a lot of newspaper comment at the time, uh, meant that when we came to respond to the Reserve Bank's challenge, if you will, you had the right conditions uh, of getting people to make business decisions which were collaborative rather than distinct. Because those guys, uh, those guys had to come up with an answer and they couldn't really afford to have another Mambo. So the psychology of that was incredibly important. Um, okay, so you've probably seen this. I'm, I'm borrowing it off the net for a different purpose. Um, given what I've said, that we don't know, we've got a long lead time, we don't know the future, um, it's hard for us to... Um, conceptualise exactly what's needed and there will be a lot of competing agendas, there's no substitute from having uh, a lot of debate and that is a good and healthy thing and it should be, as far as possible, public debate in my suggestion. Um, and expect a lot of people with their own business agendas pushing ideas that fit their model but not necessarily other people's and the game, of course, is to get them to step up above that and say, yeah, but what's in the long-term best interests of the community? That is the hard bit and then having that decision made in a place where it can be um, held to and held on, and we need industry champions for that. Um, my, my view of the world is that there is no substitute for the industry players doing this themselves together. Um, I am used to hearing, over my 15-odd year career in this game, banks say, oh, we don't like to collaborate with the other banks because it's too hard and it never works. Yeah, it's hard, absolutely, absolutely. But uh, unfortunately, in networks, it's unavoidable um, because the only alternative is compliance, is some kind of a mandated outcome. And sure, you can be forced to build something. And I've heard a number of bankers over the years say, yeah, look, it'd be easier if someone just told us that we had to spend the money and that would solve our problem. In my view, that doesn't solve the problem because when you get a compliance outcome, you get a compliance outcome. People do the minimum they have to do in order to get the compliance to meet the, leg the legislative requirement, whatever it is. So we can't really afford that. We actually want people to want to build this new payment system because it's a fantastic business opportunity. That's the exciting bit about it. And uh, it's also the tricky bit, making that work. Okay, so the basic idea is Empirical research really matters. Um, we've got to be very inclusive. 
We've got to be very deliberate and intentional about how we go about this, what's the process, what's the analysis, where do we make decisions, when do we make decisions, who makes decisions, um, as long as ultimately it's the community that decides. Um, whoever that community is, and that in itself can be controversial, of course, but it's got to be, it's got to be the community that, that ultimately makes the decision. And I think, for what it's worth, that the smartest thing the RBA in Australia, the Reserve Bank, ever did was to say, we want you guys to come up with the solution, but we're not giving you forever to do it. That, that was powerful and it was galvanising and the industry managed to respond, which was a good thing. So that's kind of all I've got to say about um, design. I'm very happy, unfortunately my staff already know, I'm very happy to talk at tedious length about this stuff. So by all means, come and have a chat at our stand outside. Thank you very much. Any, any questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Pizza cake, eh? Hey? Yeah, that's a very, very good point because actually the most expensive stuff is never in the middle. That's absolutely right. It is the rebuilding or the building of... Um, the service provider infrastructure that actually is the hard bit. And I think we were lucky, to be honest, in Australia that, that several of the large banks had themselves made a decision to rebuild their legacy architecture at roughly the same time. So they were on a journey anyway, and it was a question of timing after that. Not everybody, mind you. So a couple of the big banks made a decision to stick with legacy infrastructure and, and sort of build front ends on it and, and otherwise adapt for the new real-time environment. But you, you, I can say this because it's public record, the, the biggest bank in Australia, Combank, spent, and they, this is their number, I believe, a billion bucks retooling their architecture for a real-time world. So they obviously decided holistically that that's what they had to do. Now we were lucky, I guess, because there's no way I've got any kind of influence over that kind of process. It's just, it is what it is. Any other questions? Hello, Chris. I, um, my question was very much around not just the South African market, but to your point around where the future lies, and particularly in the SEDIC, and I see Edwards here, the regional imperative and yeah. the vision of, well, where are payments going and the ability for us to be able to respond quickly enough uh, to those changes given the complexity of a South African notwithstanding a yeah. static implication. Do you yeah. think it's possible? Do we have enough time? Well, fantastic question to which I have no useful answer, I'm, afra I'm afraid. Um, I, uh, I am, I mean, one reason why I'm here, to be honest, is, is the potential for that. I figure there's got to be some kind of a possibility there. Uh, do I know what it is right now? A absolutely not. But, but my intuition, and I'm sure you're much more experienced, Africa Ham, than me, um, I'm sure that there is an opportunity to radically reduce the cost base and provide all sorts of new business opportunities for the existing payment organisations if we can get some of those basic rails right. And the trick will be working out the layering, I suspect. Um, where, you know, where does the basic set of rail start and stop and, and who's building stuff, on, who's allowed to build stuff on top of it, those kind of points. They're the tricky things to sort out to get the business design right. But I'd love to have the conversation. <laughs> Any other questions, ladies and <coughs> gentlemen? Chris, if I may ask the question. Uh, sure. Many, many projects are compliance-driven as opposed to real innovation. It seems as though the implementation of the NPP in uh, Australia was following like a middle route uh, um, requested and mandated by the RBA. Yep. Is that more or less how it played out in Australia? So, a so, uh, combination of both. And I do think that the, that is probably the only way you get an outcome. I shouldn't say that. Uh, that, that is a, a viable way to get an outcome. It may not be the only way. 
uh, in the, the complexity of modern payment systems. So yes, there was a regulatory imperative, although that regulatory imperative was never expressed in legislation or formal regulation. It was the RBA saying, guys, we need to do this, mm -hmm. and if you guys don't put money into it, we'll build it the way we want to and expect you to join. Mm -hmm. So that's not really a regulatory imperative, although it is a central bank sort of power, I guess. Um, what then happened, though, was that the senior bankers that we got around the table formed the view that if they were going to have to do this anyway, they may as well do it in a way which had the potential to make money over time. So that took it past the compliance point. And so then the challenge was getting them to agree what that looked like in a, enough time to respond. So it's a combination of both, <coughs> business opportunity and compliance requirement. So, so was that an exercise where you had to herd the cats? For instance, <laughs> it, it cost you a lot of money to implement the NPP. Yeah, um, that's right. So, so uh, significant millions of dollars, Australian dollars, in the middle. But as we were talking about before, the big cost is actually around the outside. I think I said at the launch that we thought the whole industry would probably spend a billion bucks on, on the whole thing. That was a wild guess, of course. I've got no sound basis for that. But that's a, that's a factor, you know, more than ten times the cost of the central piece of infrastructure because the real cost is in all the stuff around the outside. Bear this in mind as well. The NPP, one of the things that makes it unusual, is that once you finish building the basic rail, you haven't built a payment system, you've just built connectivity. So you then have to, someone has to come along and commercially provide bespoke payment services built on top of that thing, which hopefully will be a lot cheaper because you've yeah. built the basic rail. But so it's more contingent, it's more complex. And, um, uh, you know, that's the banks... But that, that, I think, was a key factor in the banks forming the view that they could potentially offer sustainable products. It gave them flexibility and opportunity. Thank you, Chris. I think a last question from my side, if there are no other questions. So, uh, joining BankSurf and South Africa, <laughs> uh, are you seeing a lot of cats in this uh, environment? <laughs> They're big cats, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> Chris, uh, thanks a lot for that. Thank, for, uh, thank you for the thought-provoking and the paradigm-shifting speech that you've given us. Uh, we would like, in appreciation for this, just oh, give you a small... You. Something? Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. Thank Thanks you. Gentlemen, thank you.